Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Melanie Rubin, Director of Senior and Adult Programs at the Lawrence Family Jewish Community Center, Jacobs Family Campus. Please note that we are recording this program. Every few months, we arrange for these Middle East updates and alternate between two speakers. Today, we'll hear from Dan Schwimmer. And our next one with Mark Silberstein, zooming in from Israel, will be on Thursday, April 22nd at 10 a.m., so be on the lookout for it in our monthly e-blast, and I'll put the link to register for it in the chat. The San Diego International Jewish Film Festival is underway through February 21st for you to screen from the comfort of your home as they're all being offered virtually. And there are 10 Israeli films among the lineup. Want to take a trip to Israel? Speaking of which, join JLearn and Jew Jewish National Fund on a virtual tour of Israel, March 14th to 19th. Our next monthly JCC Social Circles movie discussion will be on February 23rd about the film Lady Bird. So stream it in advance and then join us. And celebrate Purim through Songs of Victory and Triumph on February 25th with the Osher Marin JCC. I'll put the links to register for these in the chat as well. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn the spotlight over to Dan, who will give a brief introduction of himself for those who have not yet attended these before, and he'll answer questions throughout the presentation. So please put them in the chat, or you can direct them to his lovely wife today, who is known as Her Royal Highness on the <laughs> screen name. Uh, Lee is her name, who has also joined us. So thank you so much, and take it away, Dan. Thank you, Melanie. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am coming to you live from Dallas, Texas, where we are under rolling blackouts. So uh, hopefully I have a reserve battery power and um, I'm coming to you via phone hot link because our internet is down. It's a, a very interesting uh, day, two, three, four, five days of sub Arctic weather, but uh, uh, for those of you who do not know me, and I'm not sure how many there are because lots of people do not have video on, um, and if you want to add your videos, we can see your smiling faces, that would be great. Um, uh, my name is Dan Schwimmer. I've been in San Diego for, I don't know, 40 some odd years, very involved in uh, APAC, the uh, Pro-American Israel Relationship uh, Lobbying Group, and so I've been involved in uh, pro-Israel politics for a very long time, and history is kind of my, my passion. I'm a news hound. I spend a couple hours a day browsing numerous uh, sources. And um, I've been speaking to this group for many years and it's really always a pleasure because it's such an educated group and I appreciate it. I want to encourage uh, questions that you can again put the through to my wife, Lee, or might be showing up as uh, her Royal Highness on whatever that means. Um, my, I, I do like to say at the beginning that um, I, I, I try, to tell you when it's my opinion and, and present facts as facts and opinion as facts. And if I get on my soapbox um, and, and do make a mistake and present something as a fact that's really an opinion, you guys are, are more than welcome to call me out on that. Um, you know, and if you're seeking clarification and you have a question, please put it in. I like the interactive uh, uh, part of uh, uh, presenting this. So what I'd like to do is um, take a, Take us around a couple of the, the current topics uh, in the Middle East. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to try to cover uh, Iran and the uh, JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, um, and, and various aspects of that. Uh, a little bit about what uh, foreign policy uh, statements or positions the new Biden administration has expressed so that we get a feel for where American Israeli American Middle Eastern uh, political issues might be uh, directed. And then I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about the Abraham Accords and um, kind of how that's going, what that means, and what kind of interpretations uh, there are. If we have time, I've got a couple other topics and notes presented. And as always, I like to finish with some good news because sometimes these lectures or these discussions, I should say, um, can feel a little negative and disheartening. Um, and so I like to try to finish with some good news. So um, let me start with Iran and the JCPOA, uh, the, which is the joint, uh, oh, I don't even know what, the, what it stands for anymore. Let's say the Iran nuclear deal. It'll come to me in a second. Uh, you know, is it working? And uh, do we even know, you know, what, what's been happening? So there's 
uh, an excellent summary of the agreement uh, that was put out recently by former Israeli ambassador to the US, Michael Oren. I'll give you just a couple of points because I, I think it will give us a little bit of context. And the first one is, so proponents of uh, the Iran agreement say that Iran is closer to producing a bomb today than they were when the agreement was signed in 2015, and that only the deal's renewal uh, will prevent the nightmare of a nuclear Iran. And so uh, let me take that, that argument for a second and say, so why then aren't the Israelis and the Arabs in the Middle East clamoring for um, the United States to return to the JCPOA and, and to reactivate the deal? Because the deal has uh, mostly fallen apart with the US withdrawal and now Iran's numerous actions, which we're gonna go into just some details. And, and the answer I believe is that the JCPOA didn't do what it was supposed to do, which was uh, diminish the Iranian nuclear um, uh, program and threat. It, it actually magnified it. It actually uh, made Iran a, a, a worse player in the world. Um, you know, it's interesting, and, and this is something I didn't know, but in a recording obtained by Israel, of course they don't say where, uh, shared with the United States back in 2008, so long before the 2015 JCPOA, um, the nuclear weapons head in Iran, uh, uh, General uh, Motion, I can't pronounce the right, uh, the last name, Fakhriz Adeh. This is the guy that was assassinated recently in Iran, right? He's the head of the Iran nuclear program. They have a recording of him from 2005 that explained Iran's secret efforts after 2003, which the US intelligence had, had told the president that the Iranian nuclear program had stopped in 03, but in 08, they have this recording that Iran initially was gonna produce five nuclear warheads. Um, that, that should have been a clue that maybe there was more to the program than, there, than they were claiming. And then of course, three years ago, Israel uh, uh, grabbed the Iranian nuclear file, their archives, right? Right out of a bunch of safes. So you guys have probably all seen the pictures of a whole bank of, of safes full of uh, materials, D, uh, CDs and so on that Israel carted out of the country or sprinted away the digital part of it and the D CDs um, that uh, they in fact did not stop their program in 2003. So I think it's really, really important to keep that in mind when we're thinking about what's gonna happen with the JCPOA and what the Biden administration might do. So um, the JCPOA, JCPOA, of course, uh, gave Iran billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue by lifting the sanctions and allowing them uh, to sell oil. And the thought was, and, and you know, look, it was in good intentions that the Obama administration, I think, genuinely believed that if we treat Iran with respect and, and lift the sanctions, that they will come into the uh, uh, nation, the community of nations, and will modify their bad behavior. In fact, we know six years later, five years later, that the exact opposite happened. They used the money that they got to uh, increase their support of terrorist and disruptive organizations, whether it would be Assad in Syria, whether it's Hezbollah in Lebanon, whether it's Hamas uh, in, in Gaza uh, or the Houthis in, um, in Yemen, uh, they, they, they stirred up much more trouble uh, with that money. And now that the sanctions are back on and they're having economic problems, not only because of the sanctions and the lack of, of petroleum dollars, but of course um, the pandemic uh, is hitting them, and so you know they're 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 really hurting, and and their population is also somewhat uh, revolting against uh, the government. So the 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 supporters of the deal uh, go under a fundamental assumption uh, that you know we can get Iran to abandon their nuclear program, which of course they still to this day, they're very consistent, they claim is for peaceful purposes only. And I'm gonna go through a whole series of facts and admissions uh, by various entities that will just, I mean, if you can still come to that conclusion, I, I will be amazed. Um, unfortunately, they haven't moderated their behavior 
And uh, so the, the, the basis for the JCPOA really has been undermined and disproven. So here's just a few recent events. Let's just take some facts about what has happened. Okay, so back in September of 2017, let's just start a few years ago and we'll just work our way up to the present day, right up to this week. Um, the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, that's the, gar the agency that is a UN uh, agency that is responsible for uh, compliance with international or, or national nuclear agreements. Okay, so when Iran uh, signed the JCPOA, the IAEA was responsible for monitoring, inspecting, and reporting, and then uh, they were involved in the any dispute resolution process also. So they said back in 2017 that um, there were issues related to the design and development of a nuclear weapon, the weaponization of their nuclear program, which they claim is for civilian use, uh, that they wanted answers to. And Iran refused to answer them. And so they, they went to uh, the players in the JCPOA and Iran refused, Russia backed them, and the United States and the Europeans never called them to task. And so really one of the most important pieces of the JCPOA, which is inspections, right? And answers to questions that don't make sense or that might show violations of the, of the, uh, uh, of the deal. I was gonna call it a treaty, it wasn't a treaty. Um, it never happened, okay? So they, they just, uh, one of the most important credibility pieces of the agreement was never enforced. So when there was a question and it was put to the Iranians and they stonewalled, there was little or nothing uh, that was accomplished. Uh, so, you know, th this has got to, at least to me, seriously undermine my confidence in the enforceability of, of the agreement from the get-go. Okay, January 29th, 2019, a couple years ago, uh, the U.S. intelligence chiefs of all the different intelligence agencies told the government, told a Senate intelligence committee, quote, Iran is not aiming to develop nuclear weapons and is not violating the JCPOA nuclear deal, unquote. Now, I got to tell you that with all the evidence in hand, uh, especially what Israel had grabbed from Iran and shared with the United States intelligence agencies, it's beyond me how we could come to that assessment. All right. So to me, that was a political assessment rather than an actual assessment. But hindsight is easy. This was two years ago, but still a lot has happened in two years. Also in 2019, the IAEA, which is still in Iran doing inspections, Okay, and we'll get to a point on that in a second. Found multiple undeclared uranium particles, including enriched uranium. Okay, at a secret site in Tehran. Uh, if you were watching a couple of years ago when Bibi Netanyahu was at the UN in their annual uh, event, and he showed a picture of a gates in front of a warehouse, and he said, "We think." that they're, they've been conducting nuclear activities here undisclosed and not in accordance with the agreement. And we want the UN, the IAEA to inspect. It took over a year for the IAEA to get there. And when they finally got there, that's exactly what they found. They found evidence of uh, nuclear material despite Iran's uh, flat out denials. In 2020, the United Nations inspectors, this again would be IAEA, found new evidence of undeclared activities at two more sites. This makes three that the Iranians have said, no, 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 we're not doing anything. And they've now found, you know, Iran, when you have nuclear material on site, it leaves a, a, a radioactive signature, it leaves a trace. You can't just dig up the dirt and move it away and, and have no residual, even though that's exactly what Iran tried to do. So now you have three uh, sites. Uh, the IAEA requested access to these two additional sites. Iran uh, stonewalled for seven months. In the meantime, they knocked down buildings, they moved dirt, they tried to what they call cleanse the sites. And once the IAEA got there, they found radioact traces of radioactive material anyway, okay? So what was the panel, uh, I'm sorry, let me get, get in this. Um, the IAEA's response in finding that uh, those traces was uh, they asked Iran for explanations. Iran gave them explanations, and the IAEA said that uh, 
Iran's explanations are, quote, not technically credible. So in other words, what they told us doesn't make any sense, and, and it's, it's not a good explanation. So what was the penalty for having held up the inspections for seven months, right, and then giving answers that didn't, didn't make any sense? The members on the IAEA board voted to censure Iran. So they went like this. Okay, that was the penalty. So Iran knows that if they don't comply, there's really no, no penalty, right? Okay, I mean, the penalty, the biggest penalty that's happened is the US withdrawing from the deal and reimposing sanctions. Um, Iran, just at the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021, has now started to reinstall part of the JCPOA was for them to remove all their centrifuges. Okay, and that's where they spin gas into concentrated uranium, which they can then enrich into uh, a higher and higher grade. And when you, you get to 95% uh, or 90% uh, uh, uranium, enriched uranium, now you have bomb grade material. Okay, and so they, they used to have IR1 centrifuges, which would operate at this level. Then they did two that are faster. They're now installing IR6 centrifuges, which are infinitely faster than what they had back in 2015, because the deal allowed them to continue their research to make bigger, better, faster, more efficient centrifuges to process the uranium faster. These are in direct violation. It, having installed them, they, they were allowed to develop them, the technology, stupid part of the deal, but one of the many things we objected to at APAC when it was when they were negotiating the deal. And now they're installing them. That is against um, the deal itself. They're not allowed to, but they're doing it. And so now you get this much, much shortened time frame. We'll get to a couple of estimates of time frames in a second. So they've completed, the, they're in cascades, they're called. They've completed the installation of one cascade of 174 centrifuges. They're almost finished with the second cascade and the third one should be done within a couple of months. So the bottom line is Iran is in overdrive to produce enriched uranium. Now, let's just go back because we talked about this before and let's be real clear. There's three main elements to the nuclear threat from Iran or anybody's nuclear threat. One is you got to develop the material, all right? So they've almost completed, they have completed the, the uranium cycle. They can mine it, they can uh, in, uh, uh, turn it into gas and then enrich it into enriched uranium. That's piece one. Piece two is you got to have a delivery vehicle to, if you are going to create a bomb, you got to deliver it somehow. And they're very, very, very far along on their missile technology and their ability to lift a missile with a bomb on top, okay? The third piece is the, is the weapon. That's the bomb, right? You got to be able to develop a bomb. You got to have a, 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 an ignition portion of it, some way to ignite the, the nuclear reaction. And you have to have a, um, a way to put it on top of a missile where it goes you know, 100 miles up into the atmosphere and then comes down and survives, right? Because that's what an intercontinental ballistic does. And they have, they, they, they are now, and we're going to get to that, working on the, the metal, the uranium metal, the nuclear metal that can protect the bomb as it comes back into the atmosphere. So th this, we believe they're still working on and they don't have yet. And they have to miniaturize the bomb so that it fits on a warhead. So there's some technical pieces. So the world doesn't come to an end and Iran is not ready to bomb anybody just because they have enriched uranium. Let's be real clear about that. And that they probably are down to, and we'll see an estimate, um, somewhere between four and six months, they can make enough material to do a bomb. But they still have to fashion it into a bomb and they still have to figure out how to shape it into a warhead. Okay, so um, on February 6th, couple of weeks ago of this year, Iran started producing uranium metal at a nuclear facility. They, they admit it. They announced it. This is in direct violation of the JCPOA. Uh, the ministers of Britain, France, and Germany, not exactly the most you better comply kind of members of the JCPOA, have said, quote, uranium metal has no credible civilian use. There is no known civilian use for uranium metal. The only use for it is a bomb. 
So when Iran continues to deny that they have a military use or program for uranium, they're full of crap, all right? And now they've started to say, well, you know, if you back a cat into a corner, you never know what it's gonna do. Our intentions might be good, but if you, if you back us into a corner, well, maybe our intentions will become bad. So now they're starting to shift the narrative in ways with comments like that. Now, here's a big one. Iran on February 21st, that can't be. Now, oh, excuse me. They've warned that on September 21st, that's next week, that uh, unless the US removes sanctions, they will start to restrict the access of, of the IAEA inspectors. And this is something that has been on the table uh, for a very long time. Uh, this is their, one of the cards that they can play and will freak out a lot of people uh, because when we have no eyes and ears on what they're doing, we'll be guessing big time. Now, just because they tell us they're doing X doesn't mean they're not doing Y the entire time. And so I, I, you know, they've been lying to the world for a long time despite the inspections, but the inspections have given us some information. Now, earlier this month, February 2nd, Iran's defense ministry said, and they released a video of a new satellite launch vehicle called the Zuhana. Don't ask me, I'm probably mispronouncing it. Doesn't matter. Here's the point about it. They showed and claim that this is a mobile launching device and a solid fuel device. Now, both of those, um, are advances for them. And here's the point. When you launch a rocket with a satellite on top, the whole world does that, or anybody that has technology to do it, they, from a fixed launch site. The only reason to put a rocket that can launch a satellite on a mobile transport is to hide it until it's ready to blow all right, so that you can't destroy it while you're fueling it. And that's why solid fuel is better than liquid fuel if you don't want anybody to know you're about to launch a missile. So what it says is the only reason we developed this missile is to deliver a bomb from a mobile launcher so that nobody can hit it while we're fueling it. So it's, again, all of these individually are not a, a be all end all. But when you start putting each one of these pieces into the puzzle, you start to get a picture that is pretty darn clear. Um, another thing they're doing is they're enriching their uranium to 20%. Okay, so under the JCPOA, they were only allowed to enrich to four or 5%. I apologize for which one. And now let me be very, very clear. If you start at zero and you get to 90% enriched bomb grade, it's not a straight line. Okay, to go from zero to five is like this, and from five to 20 is like this, and from 20 to 90 is like this. It takes you longer to go from five to 20% enrichment than it does to go from 20 to 90. Okay, it's just the way that the process works. So the fact that they're now enriching to 20%, which is in direct violation of the, of the, the agreement, um, is shortening that time frame astronomically, and they're doing it with these more advanced centrifuges. So um, France, Germany, and the UK have all called on Iran to stop the 20% enrichment. And again, they say, quote, enrichment to 20% has no credible civilian justification. So all the other players, were, you know, the US and the previous administration are not the only ones who have said, what you're doing it makes no sense when you want to claim that it's for civilian use, okay? Everything they're doing points to uh, a military use. What else is Iran doing while there's this discussion about returning to the JCPOA by the United States? They grabbed a South Korean oil tanker out of the Gulf, okay? So the U.S. put financial sanctions down. South Korea, in compliance with US sanctions against Iran froze $7 billion of Iranian money that was in Korean banks, South Korean banks. So in retaliation, Iran grabbed one of their oil tankers out of, right out of the Gulf. You know, they just boarded it and, and, and towed it, steered it. I don't think you tow an oil tanker, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, put it into an Iranian port. And now South Korea is you know, having to negotiate to try to get it back. Um, these are all threatening moves, okay? Um, 
about a week ago, no, I'm sorry, about uh, three weeks ago, just before the inauguration, I think on January 14th was the date, that uh, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, then Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, um, confirmed that the number two Al-Qaeda guy, Abu Mohammed al-Masri, was shot to death in Tehran a few months ago. What's the point and why does that matter? What it tells you is that Al-Qaeda has moved to Iran. They're being sheltered in Iran. So this is just another example. This is not directly to the nuclear portion of the, of the, uh, of the issue, but what bad behavior uh, is Iran conducting? And they're now the main address for Al-Qaeda. The number two guy was living in Iran. There are numerous top Al-Qaeda people who have virtual free reign uh, to plan and to live and to uh, uh, do bad stuff in Iran. A letter from bin Laden that was captured when the U.S. got bin Laden, right, when the Navy SEALs grabbed him, uh, uh, killed him in uh, Pakistan, sums up the relationship um, pretty well since 9-11, quote, Iran, is, this is bin Laden's words, Iran is our main artery for funds, personnel, and communications, unquote. So if you think that Iran is moderating, and if you think that the JCPOA moderated them, or a return to the JCPOA will moderate them, I'm trying to give you what I consider to be a litany of arguments and facts and actions uh, that would just that would make you should make you scratch your head a bit. Okay, um, there was a quote by Pompeo at the time in, in that uh, discussion. He said, quote, let's not lie to the American people about Iranian moderation and pretend that appeasement will work. And I think those are really clear words to contemplate. So here's one more example. Where's the moderation by the Iranians? Okay, Khamenei, the, the Supreme Leader, uh, explain, he wrote a book. He just released a book. I'm not even sure it's been released, but he, the advanced copies are out. It's called Palestine. And he explains in his book how Israel will be wiped out. Put it right in writing. It will be encircled by territories that will serve as mega launching pads of rockets aimed at civilian population centers. In Lebanon, Hezbollah's got an estimated 150,000 rockets. Gaza, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad are estimated to have 10,000 rockets. And Iran is trying to turn Syria into the third front for basing rockets that can hit anywhere in Israel. So again, this isn't directly related to the nuclear deal, but it talks about what, what is the thinking and actions that are being taken or things that are being said or threatened by the Iranian leadership. And I think it's, it's really important to, to keep all that in mind. What does the Israeli military say? Okay, this month, this in February, the last couple of weeks, uh, IDF military intelligence came out and said, "quote It would that they estimated it would take Iran six months to produce enough uh, fissile material, uranium, enriched uranium, for a single nuclear weapon." And as for the weapon itself, they think the range, Israeli intelligence, military intelligence, thinks it's one to two years for them to develop the weapon that could be delivered, okay? So uh, the U.S. has said four months, Israel saying six months. Uh, there's a fair amount of agreement uh, as to how long it might be to weaponize, and, and one to two years seems to be that time frame. So the question is, where do we go from here? If this has been the behavior, and these have been the actions and the words uh, uh, coming up to this point, and uh, President Biden has said all through the campaign and, and since he's become president that he would like to rejoin the JCPOA, okay? So how, what, how, what does that look like and how could that uh, possibly happen? So we had a, a conference call recently, uh, APAC, and it was all about the JCPOA and, and what uh, is probably going to be one of our issues going forward uh, on lobbying members of Congress as to how they might approach uh, the Biden administration's uh, attempt to re-enter the, uh, the deal. And it was a very, very interesting comment that was said 
by some higher up, I can't remember exactly who at uh, APEC. And they said, the, the discussion over JCPOA is going to be emotional more than it's going to be factual. And I, I, I really, that I, I heard that loud and clear. It was a really interesting comment. And so I asked for clarification. And what, what they meant was that the emotional side of it will be, there is a, whether it's this issue or any other issue, because of the political environment that we're in in the United States right now, there is a strong desire to just undo anything that happened under the previous administration. It's not policy driven, it's just they did A, we're gonna undo A. They did A, B, we're gonna do C. Whatever, however you wanna frame it. And, and so it's potentially spite, not policy. And it could be bad policy. And let me just tell you that in the 30 years I've been involved in APAC, one of the critical, critical things I've learned is APAC says, let's challenge the policy, not the person. This is all we're about is policy. If it's bad policy, we need to oppose it. Whether it's a good person or a bad person, you like the person, you don't like the person who's proposing it, doesn't matter. That's not what's the issue. Because the, obviously the players come and go. The policy is what's important. So the second emotional piece, and we're already hearing it, and we heard it the first time when the JCPOA came up, and that is the all or nothing choice. We either do the deal or go back to the deal, as the case may be now, or it's war. This is exactly the argument the first time it came up in 2015. If we don't do this agreement with Iran, there's going to be war. <laughs> Um, okay, I didn't buy it then. I don't buy it now. I don't think Iran wants a military conflict with the United States because they'll get their butts kicked. Uh, and I'm not trying to be hubris or, oh, aren't we great? We just, you got to understand, they've got an Air Force that hasn't had parts available to them for 30 years. You know, they, they may have a lot of little ships that could threaten some of our ships. There's no question about that. They've got some missiles that might be able to threaten some of our ships, but we've got tremendous defense capabilities also. And so uh, the reality is if they get into a skirmish with us, um, you know, we're, we're probably going to take down their command and control very, very quickly, and then they're going to be defenseless. Um, so, you know, you're going to kind of be like Saudi Arabia was when Iran hit them with uh, those cruise missiles and they hit all their, their largest oil processing facility in, in all of Saudi Arabia. And I don't know if you ever saw those pictures, but there were about six tanks in a row that are part of the processing system. And each one of them had a hole right in the side. They hit them just perfectly. So they've got some serious weapon ability. There's no doubt. But on the fact side, emotion versus fact, when we're arguing the JCPOA, the fact side is to coordinate with our allies, with Israel with our Arab allies in the Middle East and with our European allies. And right now, this is a very, very different thing than we heard in 2015. All of our Arab allies and our, I mean, Israel is saying the exact same thing they said in 2015, but the Europeans are saying something completely different now. They're telling Biden, don't lift the sanctions. You've got pressure if you lift the sanctions you lose the leverage. This is exactly what happened in 2015. You know, President Obama lifted the sanctions and Iran just went on, a, you know, a gravy train shopping spree. And, and so they're getting it uh, a completely different message. So we'll see if that holds water um, because, you know, now you have a coalition of Israel and some Arab countries, right? Uh, because of the Abraham Accords. And you've got the Europeans who maybe they've woken up, maybe they're tired of uh, Iran doing whatever they want uh, with no consequences. I don't know exactly why, but uh, they're, they're saying something different. French President Macron said, quote, any new talks should include Saudi Arabia. Now, remember, the last time there was, Israel wasn't at the table and there wasn't an Arab country at the table, right? It was the P5 plus one. With the P6, plus, it was just the Europeans, the Russians, um, Iran, and the United States. That, that, that's who was at the table. Now they're saying something different. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, 
who I personally uh, think has, has a lot of credibility in my book. I think he's a very measured guy. I think he's got really a long historical perspective and he doesn't you know, knee jerk react to anything. He said, quote, we should not fool ourselves about the Iran deal. With the time limit and so many escape clauses, the only thing that that deal will do, it will do anything other than bring nuclear weapons all over the Middle East. Okay, so that's what Henry Kissinger's conclusion is about the JCPOA uh, right now. We're just going back to it. Secretary of State uh, Anthony, uh, Tony Blinken, Anthony Blinken, um, when this comment came out, he was the nominee. So I, I, I got my notes straight here, pledged to consult with Israel, Gulf allies, and Congress when, quote, seeking a longer and stronger agreement to rein in Iran. He said that the administration would, quote, engage on the takeoff, not just the landing, which is what happened in 2015. Israel was not consulted. The United States was negotiating with Iran in secret. They never invited Israel to the table. And when Israel objected, then the relationship between Bibi and, and uh, President Obama uh, just went to crap in a handbasket, right? And we all remember Bibi coming to address, being invited to address Congress and, and on the hoopla about that. And uh, you know how many people didn't come and they are uh, horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, what, what is Israel looking for from a new, improved, JCPOA 2 plus, whatever you want to call it, there's all kinds of names for it. They're looking really for two major items that were not in the first deal, and that is to remove the sunset clauses on uranium enrichment, which are going to expire in five years if, in fact, um, we go back into the deal. Very, very short time frame. Um, and anywhere, anytime inspections. Now, we heard a lot about that when it was being negotiated the first time. It was a, you know, and we heard all about snapback provisions. Remember that that word snapback? If they violate, we're going to snap back sanctions, right? Didn't happen. I mean, we we asked the UN to reimpose sanctions when Iran started violating the deal, um, and they they never did anything. And to this day, they still haven't, despite all the things that I have shown you. Uh, the U.S. is the only one who has put sanctions back on. So. Um, that and, and the inspection, I've given you examples of how the inspection regime set up in this agreement doesn't work. It, it, it's a farce. And it was a farce from the get-go, right? Um, I hate to say it, but, uh, well, I, I, I'll get to it in a second. I'll give you my little thing. Um, the outlook in Iran. So one of the things that we were looking at in 2015 was, wait a minute, there's elections in Iran and we want to support the moderates. That was Rouhani who was yet to be elected, but we considered him to be a moderate, even though he was part of a deflection and deception in keeping the uh, uranium program, development program going uh, before he became president. So now that you're getting the same argument, wait, 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 Iran's going to have elections. We need to support the moderates and not be all tough on them right now. Well, let me tell you, they're having elections in Iran for a new president in June, okay? Three months. There are five candidates. All five candidates have been vetted. They're the only five candidates that were approved by Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, and they're all Revolutionary Guard members. They're all members of the, the, the top flight uh, military people who basically own the Iranian economy and enforce uh, the religious edicts of uh, the religious rulers. That is not a promising uh, scope for who we're gonna be negotiating with or what their stance might be, okay? On January 28th, the IDF chief of staff, uh, Kohavi, ordered the US defense forces, now they made this public and there's a reason that they, they published this comment, to come up with plans and possible offensive action against Iran to prevent the Iranians from uh, acquiring a nuclear weapon. Now, this was a, obviously a shot across the bow, both to the Biden administration and to the Iranians, to let them know, look, the military option is on the table. Israel is not afraid to say so. 
during the 2015 negotiation, there was all kinds of comments about, well, we're retaining all options. The military option is always on the table. The military option was never on the table uh, from at least the Obama administration. And people were very, very worried that it was on the table under the Trump administration. Okay, now we're gonna see what the Biden administration does. But the bottom line is Israel is saying, they're not just putting out lip service. We're not going to allow Iran to become a nuclear power. Israel is saying we're putting the military option on the table. Now, if you hadn't noticed or hadn't read, the United States has got some B-52s in the Middle East now. The B-52 is only one of two planes that can carry a bunker buster bomb, which is such a big bomb, but it would be the bomb that would need be needed to destroy the Fordo nuclear processing plant that Iran has built underneath a mountain. And, and so it's very interesting that suddenly there are B-52s in, in the Middle East. Um, here's another thing that's going on in preparation or as we move along, and that is that the US military has been negotiating with the Saudis to establish more bases in Saudi Arabia that could be used in the event of a conflict with Iran over their nuclear program. And Saudi Arabia has agreed to pay to develop those sites and improve those sites for US use. It's a very interesting thing. You know, you don't go around doing that if you don't think you have, as an important need to have or a uh, chit to, to have in your pocket. Now here's something that you really need to think about. A lot of the players that are, that President Biden is putting into his administration are the exact same players who negotiated the 2015 JCPOA. Let me give you just a few of them, okay? Wendy Sherman. Wendy Sherman was one of the lead negotiators, if not the lead negotiator in the 2015 deal. She is now Deputy Secretary of State in the Obama administration. Robert Malley was at the same level as Wendy Sherman as a top negotiator in the 2015 deal, is now the U.S. envoy to Iran. And you're going to hear Mali's name. If you don't recognize that name, believe me, you're going to hear it. It's going to be a confirmation fight because he has a lot of really bad things to say about Israel. So he's he's not a, an objective guy. This is This is a dangerous guy to have in a top position in the administration. William Burns who is now going to be the CIA director, uh, led the initial talks with Iran uh, before it was announced, when they were secret talks uh, behind the scenes, before they announced negotiations. He led those negotiations. Anthony Blinken, Tony Blinken, who is now Secretary of State, he was one of the negotiators on the 2015 deal. Jake Sullivan, who is now the National Security Advisor to the President, was also a deal negotiator. So you've got numerous top people in the Biden administration who were involved in negotiating the 2015 deal who are now in the administration. In my opinion, they did an incredibly bad job negotiating the deal in 2015. It may not have been their fault, okay, because John Kerry and Barack Obama were running the show and they were the ones who were making the decisions about what to give away. But we gave away the store in, in that deal and got very little. And what we got, Iran has already and easily reversed. And they've admitted to lying on parts of what they said they did, like destroying the Arik heavy water reactor, which there's only one use for heavy water, heavy water and that's to produce plutonium, which is, is used for a bomb. Um, and now they say they can easily reverse what they did that, that theoretically destroyed the reactor. All right, so they're coming clean. So. Here's a couple of quotes to just wrap up and give perspective on this issue. Uh, Amos Yodlin, the former head of the IDF military intelligence. Here's his quote on the JCPOA. Uh, Hope is not a strategy. Pretty, pretty clear cut. Um, you know, I, I would agree with that. The former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO said recently that senior Israelis that he has spoken with quote, reiterate their belief that Iran will eventually successfully build a nuclear arsenal unless 
It is stopped by direct military intervention. He points to how the world treats North Korea. Now, you know the North Korean story and nuclear bombs. They made deal after deal with the United States for aid, and they promised not to develop their nuclear uh, uh, program. And all the while, they were doing it. They were taking every concession that the U.S. gave them, all the food and all the foreign aid, and they continued the, the, their program until they exploded a bomb. And then we went, our, our intelligence services were caught completely off guard. Same with Pakistan. And they went, oh, and now you can't do anything to North Korea because, I mean, not only their proximity to South Korea and Seoul, which is only miles away from the DMV, DMZ, but uh, because we know they've got nuclear bombs. They may not have the missile capable, or they may, but so Iran is watching that very carefully. Uh, so, you know, th this is kind of how I look at um, the whole JCPOA. Um, do we have any, let me just check my chat here. I see some chats in here and let me just see if, none to me yet. Okay, so great. So if you will indulge me, I will leave uh, the JCPOA. If you guys have some questions, by all means, uh, send them in and, and we can uh, talk about that. I want to talk about the new administration and, and some of the examples and indices uh, of what we might expect, uh, what their positions might be. Now, we already talked about uh, numerous members of the administration who are key positions uh, who have been through the whole uh, Iranian negotiation before and bring maybe some baggage with them or some of their ideas that about why that deal would work, should have worked from 2015 to 21 and going forward, how they might be able to make it work. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. On January uh, 19th, I, and, and let me just tell you that I w was extremely fearful and skeptical uh, about how the uh, Biden administration would come out on issues related to Israel and uh, Iran and the Middle East as a whole. And I can tell you that I've been pleasantly surprised so far that uh, I think they're making a lot of pronouncements, a lot of statements and taking some actions that I think are the right ones. And, and so I am um, I'm encouraged by that. So let me give you a couple of examples of, of what I have heard and why I think that that's good. On January 19th at his uh, Senate confirmation hearing, now Secretary of State, because he's been confirmed, Tony Blinken, uh, was asked, do you agree that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and do you commit that the United States will keep our embassy in Jerusalem? His answer was yes and yes. All right, so that was one thing that people had wondered what would the Biden administration do? And I think it's fairly clear now uh, what they will do. Um, Blinken also uh, said that a Biden, that, that uh, President Biden remained committed to a two-state solution with the Palestinians and he added, quote, and I think this is very, very important, realistically, it's hard to see near-term prospects for moving forward, unquote. So what Blinken's saying is, look, here's our broad policy. We still want a two-state solution. We just don't think the time is ripe. Don't think much is going to happen on that anytime in the near future. And I think that that's realistic. Uh, those of you that know me know that I've said very, very, very many times, the peace process is more process than peace, right? All we're doing right now, all Israel can do right now is manage the situation between Israel and the Palestinians. What about enrichment? Uh, what's the question? Oh, uh, enrichment. How much enrichment happened under Obama versus Trump? So, you know, I'm not sure how much enrichment they, so when the, the JCPOA, let me just back up and try to answer that question. The, under the JCPOA, uh, Iran had X quantity of enriched uranium. And under the deal, they had to export down to the limit. Okay, and they did. Uh, Russia came and picked it up and took it out of, out of Iran. So, you know, how much they had, and they had the old centrifuges, which could take a year to produce the same amount of uranium that they can produce in two months now. These IR6s are about six to 10 times as efficient as the IR1s were. 
So they're much, much faster and they can replace it. So it wasn't a huge deal. Clearly they're enriching more now that they're reinstalling the centrifuges, but I don't think they enriched really anything under Trump because they didn't have the centrifuges installed to spin the gas. Uh, they just admitted to feeding the, uh, the first cascade just the other day. So um, they're doing, I think a kilogram a day. There, there's a stat somewhere about how much they're doing. So uh, now they're doing more, but I, honestly they're gonna enrich way more under the Biden administration than they ever did if they did any under Trump, but that's not because they didn't want to. It was because the deal was in place and that is a piece of the deal that proponents of the deal will claim worked. But the problem was they were doing everything else behind the scenes and developing the technology and so on. Um, I saw that another question popped up. No, okay. <laughs> okay, all right, my wife's making jokes. Um, okay, this past week, this is something I'm not sure I agree with, but the Biden administration, the Trump administration, <coughs> at the end of its administration, labeled the Houthis in Yemen, who are, uh, the, quote, the rebels uh, backed by Iran that have overthrown uh, the existing government or taken over part of the country. There's a civil war going on there. Uh, Saudi Arabia is backing uh, the existing government and Iran is backing the, uh, the Houthis. Uh, the Trump administration in the last days labeled them a terrorist organization. Biden administration has uh, undone that. They have now uh, removed that designation, which has logistical issues. But let me just give you an insight. The official name of the Houthi movement is Ansar Allah, whose slogan in Arabic reads, quote, death to America, death to Israel, a curse upon the Jews, victory for Islam. Well, we've heard death to America and death to Israel, but you know, the one that really bothers me is a curse upon the Jews. Okay, you know, I, there's a lot of people in the world that hate, still hate Israel. It's getting better with the Abraham Accords, and we're going to talk about that, but I'm not sure that these are guys, and they're the, they're the ones who claim they sent the cruise missiles into Saudi Arabia and took down that refinery or put it out of commission for a while. Most people believe it was Iran, not the Houthis. They don't believe that the Houthis have anywhere near that kind of technology. Um, on February 4th, the Senate voted 97 to three to keep the US embassy in Jerusalem. Okay, this is a very strong, this is by the new Senate. Um, this is a very strong statement. What you should know is who are the three. I'll tell you, I don't know the third. Uh, it, it's Tom Carper of Delaware. Never heard of him, honestly. But the other two are Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, both people who we should probably be concerned about uh, not being friends of Israel on Capitol Hill. And that is APAC's job is to manage those relationships as best as we possibly can and have as many friends as we can when Israel um, is in need uh, so that you know you, you can't create relationships the day that you need them. You have to create them all along the way. Um, the US administration, okay, so just recently, last week or two weeks ago, the uh, International Criminal Court, the ICC, uh, determined and issued a statement, a, a ruling that they have jurisdiction over Palestinian territories because they have deemed by some magic logic that Palestine is a country, which would be the only way that they could possibly come to this conclusion. And the United, the, the current administration joined by Australia, Germany, Canada, and of course, Israel have expressed oppositions, very strong opposition to that determination and have said that they will fight it and, and try to block any enforcement. What does that mean? It means that the ICC thinks that they have the jurisdiction to issue arrest warrants, try and, and convict Israelis who they deem are guilty of war crimes against the Palestinians. Yeah, okay, got a question. What's that? Okay. Robert, okay. Right, yeah.
Okay, so um, okay, so the second one about uh, it, it hasn't the U.S. taken some hits uh, by uh, coordinating quote being in bed? I think the question asked uh, with um, uh, MBS uh, Mohammed uh, bin Salman uh, of Saudi Arabia. Um, yes, I mean, look, there Saudi Arabia is conducting a proxy war in. Yemen, because Yemen is on their southern border and Yemen keeps launching attacks um, into Saudi Arabia, maybe in, in response to Saudi Arabia's backing of, of the government of, of Yemen, it's, it's understandable, but they're also going after civilian population. But the, the Saudis have bombed indiscriminately and have killed a lot of civilians and the US Congress doesn't like it very much. And I believe the Biden administration has already put an arms embargo um, uh, on some sales, not an embargo, but it has stopped certain sales of weapons to the Saudis so that they can't use them in um, in Yemen. And so, yeah, there's there there are difficulties in that relationship. But as I have said many many times in, in these uh, uh, dialogues, um, international foreign politics is not simple. It's never black and white. It's never all good or all bad. And there aren't any easy decisions. And you know, did Saudi Arabia uh, take this guy in their embassy in Turkey and, and kill him and chop him into pieces and try to uh, hide it? Yeah. Uh, was that bad? Yeah. Is that a reason to uh, destroy one of the more important international relationships in the world? I would say no. Some people say yes. I understand the arguments and, and they're valid. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to say, we don't agree. You made a mistake. Here's a punishment, whatever it is. Now we need to move on. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, and the other question, the first question was, you know, just give me the debate. What was it about? Oh, incentive to, okay. So the other question is, what's the incentive for Iran to reverse course now? Because clearly they're taking steps that are in their nuclear program's interest. You know, the, the, the only way that sanctions are gonna be lifted uh, on Iran is if they stop the program, that's their incentive. Um, their, their economy is in an absolute free fall. Um, they might be getting used to sanctions, but you know, the value of their currency is, is just in the trash can. Um, you know, the populace is, is, is unhappy. Uh, the, it, it's, a, it's a ruling autocracy by a, a small band of religious leaders and the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, they, they own most of the businesses or the commerce that goes on, and if they don't own it, they get a piece of it. Uh, they're very content to have the status quo. And until the situation, economic situation gets bad enough, it's not gonna change. And sanctions aren't gonna change unless they change course on the uh, nuclear program. And that, 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 that's, their, um, that's their incentive. So another thing that the Biden administration wants to do, and they've announced is that they wanna reopen the Palestinian um, uh, diplomatic mission in Washington, D.C. Okay, it's not an embassy because they're not a country, but they have a, a presence. Now, they've got some complications there. Um, and that is that it, the, 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 their, their facility was closed in compliance with a law that Congress passed uh, that prohibited a PLL office unless the president can certify that the Palestinian leadership is not supporting ICC, International Criminal Court, actions against Israel. Well, clearly, clearly they are supporting ICC actions right now. They, they talk about it every day. And uh, so that is a problem number one. President Biden's plan to reopen the diplomatic mission in DC um, is, also, is held up also by a law uh, that exposes Palestinian officials, and this is the uh, Taylor Force Act, right? Remember, Taylor Force was an American in Israel who was killed in a Palestinian terrorist attack. And in response, Congress passed a, a, a Taylor Force Act that included a law that exposes or rule that exposes Palestinian authorities to U.S. anti-terror lawsuits. Now, understand, now that was passed by Congress and signed into law in 2019, okay? If that diplomatic mission was reopened under current law, there have already been $655.5 million worth of judgments against uh, the Palestinian Authority 
for terror victims of Palestinian terror. So how do they, how does how the Biden administration propose to deal with that? They're trying to amend the law. Okay, so it, it, it's important to know that the administration is trying to comply with the law. They just want to comply with a different law. So they're going to try to change the law. That's absolutely their prerogative. And it'll be very interesting to see what Congress does when the administration puts a proposed law or gets you know, uh, some of their members to put up a law that will change that so that the Palestinian mission can reopen. They're also looking, uh, I'll get to a question in a second. Uh, the la another thing that the Biden administration is looking to do is they have said, we want to resume humanitarian aid to the Palestinians. Now, this is a bit of a misnomer because the US technically has not stopped humanitarian aid. Anything that goes for medicines and food um, to aid the, the Joshmo on the ground uh, ha has never been stopped. It's funding things um, that uh, funds that we believe have been diverted for military purposes um, and for entities like uh, UNRWA at the UN that we do not believe um, is, is effective use of funds, uh, those we have cut. But uh, the Biden administration wants to, quote, resume certain aid. And again, this is going to be very tricky because that aid is restricted by the Taylor Force Act. Anytime that the Palestinians are paying salaries and pensions to uh, martyrs, right? To people who committed, I got feedback, babe, can you turn it down? Uh, that that uh, they continue to pay people who have been arrested by the Israelis for having killed Israelis, right? And the more Israelis you kill, the more aid you get as a stipend and your family gets a stipend. And so there were just brand new uh, sanctions that were that took effect on January 1st of this year under the Taylor Force Act. And so banks in the, uh, the West Bank um, are now prohibited from, from acting as conduits for these payments. So what did the Palestinians do? This doesn't tell you what their intention is better than anything else. In December, they prepaid four months worth of those wages to all of the people in jail and their families, okay? So that they can have some time to work with the Biden administration to figure out a way around um, that, that aspect of the Taylor Force Act. Now, um, I'm, I'm looking for who said this, excuse me for one second. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the problem with these payments is, is not trying to get them around the law uh, because a boss has sworn never to end these payments. And the real problem is that as long as the international community tolerates a government that pays people to murder other people, they're never going to stop. And so, you know, the Taylor Force Act is an attempt to put the, for sure, the United States, and we've convinced a lot of other entities of the same thing, you're not helping the peace process or enculturation of the Palestinian populace uh, if the government is showing that it's in your family's interest to go and kill Israelis. And by the way, the longer prison term or the more Israelis you kill, the more money you get. That th This is not a civilized way to move forward in the world, and it's got to stop. And if the Biden administration finds a way around that, I will be very disappointed. Question. This next question yeah. comes from Michael Freed. How yeah. critical is the lack of communication from Biden to Bibi since taking office? Yeah. The relationship yeah. OK, so the question is, what, you know, what, what about the fact that Biden, to date, Biden has not called Bibi? Uh, and a lot of people are very upset about that. And a Biden administration spokesperson says, look, Bibi's in the middle of an election. We don't interfere in Israeli politics, just like we don't want Israel interfering in our politics, which was the, 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 the claim against Bibi coming to address uh, Congress during an election time. OK, um, I think that there's that's a reasonable argument. I don't buy it. Uh, the United States and Israel are very, very important allies to each other. 
Uh, all contacts below the level of the president and prime minister are, are open and active. Uh, so there is lots of communication. You know, is Biden pissed at BB because BB didn't call right away when the election was called for Biden to say congratulations because there was uh, uh, arguments about the uh, election being contested? Okay, maybe that's what it is. Maybe they're off on a wrong foot. I think it'll be fine. I think, you know, if BB wins re-election, uh, I think his relationship with, with uh, Biden will be fine. If it's somebody else, I think the relationship will be with Biden will be fine. I, I don't think, I don't think it's a big issue. I think we've got bigger uh, fish to fry. Um, let me give a few comments about the Abraham Accords. We know that Israel made peace with Egypt, gave them back the Sinai. And we got a cold peace with Egypt. We had a, a peace agreement with Jordan. Jordan, the Israeli Jordan border has been the quietest border for many, many, many years. Jordan's got enormous internal problems. Israel has been helping the king of Jordan for many years in keeping him in the palace. There's a good relationship there, but it's still, it's a cold peace. And it's always going to be a cold peace as long as there isn't peace with the Palestinians because Jordan is 70% Palestinian. The new peace accords are completely different. Okay. You got the UAE, you've got Bahrain, you've got Sudan, and you have Morocco. There are lots of conversations about who else might be coming behind them, not the least of which would be Saudi Arabia, although they're waiting for the king to die. The king is still the actual ruler in Saudi Arabia, not Mohammed bin uh, Salman, uh, who is his son, one of his many sons. Um, but, uh, and so they, the king doesn't want to make, that's probably not going to happen, but there are discussions about uh, a peace with Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country on the planet, 200 million Muslims, okay? It, 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 and, and, there's, and there's supposedly about five or six other countries that are close. But what is happening with these peace agreements? Let's just look at some of the, the details, because um, this was just happening the last time I spoke, and we were talking about them resuming plane flights and, and, and so on. All right, so here's a few of the examples. And, and, and a macro would be that this a new wave of peace in the Middle East promises to be between peoples, not just governments. And that's really, really the key. So intelligence minister, uh, the Israeli intelligence minister, Eli Cohn, just recently became the first Israeli minister to visit Sudan, okay? So high level uh, uh, government officials going back and forth. Shimon Peres' son, Chemi Peres, C-H-E-M-I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, I apologize. He runs the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation. And we remember that uh, Shimon Peres won the Nobel Peace Prize, right, for, uh, for his peace efforts is prioritizing, the Peace Center is prioritizing Israeli business ties with the Emiratis, the UAE, right? An approach he wants the Palestinians to adopt in forging peaceful ties with the Israelis. He says, quote, I think that the Palestinians need to rethink the way they treat Israel. What he's saying is, you got to normalize relationships and peace will follow. You don't get a peace agreement and then normalize relationships, okay? He said further, their point of view has been, let's first solve the political issues and then we can start normalizing. I believe those days are gone, said Perez. The real way to really achieve peace, comprehensive peace, is to focus on moving forward together. Israel has reopened their diplomatic mission in Morocco, which has been closed for 20 years, okay? And Israel officially on January 24th, so less than a month ago, officially opened its embassy in uh, the, U the UAE. And that was a week after the UAE approved opening an embassy in Israel. In Tel Aviv, not in Jerusalem, I'll take what we can get. I'll take the embassy, even if it's not in Jerusalem, it's okay. You know, the, everything is in steps. The Israeli embassy in Bahrain has been open for several weeks. So these are real tangible things. I right, here's here's a, a a great one, and this is one of the reasons that these Arab countries want to uh, have peace with Israel. Israel's water company, uh, the Mekorak, I, uh, if I mispronounce it, I apologize. 
uh, is about to sign a deal to provide Bahrain with desalination, desalination uh, technology. Now, we know Israel is the leader in desal in the world. They, they, de, they recycle and desalinate more water than anybody in the world by far. Um, Merikot said uh, that Bahrain and the UAE are also interested in their negotiations for contracts on quality control of water, reduction of waste and leakage, water management systems, and the integration of technical management services. Now, why is that important? Because most of the water in, uh, in the UAE or Bahrain is brackish water, okay? And so what they need is to turn that brackish water into agricultural and drinking water because they're importing almost all of their drinking water in plastic bottles for the whole country. And it's, and it's, it's a waste and it's expensive. Henry Kissinger again, let me quote Henry Kissinger um, again, because I, I like the guy. He said regarding the Abraham Accords, quote, we should not give up on what has, been rec has recently been achieved in these agreements between the Arab world and the Israeli world. The Accords, quote, have opened a window of opportunity for a new Middle East, unquote. This is, this is big stuff. It's paradigm uh, changing stuff. According to Dennis Ross, I think we all know who Dennis Ross is. He has worked in four different administrations negotiating, attempting to negotiate peace treaties uh, between Israel and the Palestinians. And he said the establishment of formal relations between Israel and the four Arab countries, which I named, creates new realities in the Middle East. It reflects a strategic convergence between many Arab states and Israel, not just on threats, which is one of the explanations, right? Israel will help to uh, coordinate with Arabs against Iran, but also on their common interest to promote more technologically driven economies and to address water and food security needs. In other words, these Arab countries that are flush with oil want something other than oil to base their economies on, and they're gonna look for, to Israel for technology and information and, and agriculture and water technologies in order to bring their societies forward. It's a new paradigm on, and listen to these words carefully, new paradigm on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. It's no longer the Israeli-Arab issue conflict. The Israeli-Arab conflict could very well be coming to an end. And remember, Iran is not Arab. So the conflict between Iran and Israel is not part of the Israeli-Arab conflict, but there is a real chance in our lifetime for the first time, or most of our lifetimes in the first time, or last 60 years, let's just say, that there is a chance for real peace between um, Israel and the Arabs and Israel and most Muslims. And that is a fantastic thing. Bibi Netanyahu said it in this way. He said, what we have now is peace for peace instead of land for peace. And unfortunately, land for peace, it got us peace with Egypt and it's held, but it got us a cold peace. This is a true peace, mutual respect and acceptance and living and working together. So one of my favorite guys, um, Brett Stevens, I don't know if some of you read Brett Stevens, he's now uh, writes for the editorial page of the New York Times, which he used to write for the Wall Street Journal. Um, I, I've read him religiously uh, over the years and I've seen him in, in, in person a few times. Um, and, and he says a few things that also give you just perspective and then we'll, we'll, we'll go to uh, good news. And that is, he says, the Abraham Accords, the prospect that the Arab Israeli, again, Arab Israeli, not Palestinian Israeli, conflict might be brought to an end much sooner than anyone dreamed possible. Um, he makes the point, the U.S. continues to have vital interests in the Middle East, right? This is a region that accounts for close to 40% of global oil production. We cannot and we should not just turn our backs on the entire Middle East. Now, we don't have to be the world's policemen, and we've withdrawn quite a bit between the Obama administration and the Trump administration have both pulled back from involvement in the Middle East in different ways. And that's one of the reasons that the Arab countries that are making peace with Israel are gravitating toward Israel because Israel is filling that vacuum of, 
of a defense and a cooperative partner against who they deem their enemies. Their enemies are, and we haven't talked about them yet today, around, of course, we talked about, and Turkey. And, and Turkey, we've talked about it different things. I just don't have the time today. Um, Brad Stevens thinks that if the Palestinians observe that good relations between Israel and other Arab states are the norm and are productive for the Arab states, then they will have less incentive to be a violent uh, uh, opponent or uh, in contest, constant violence with, uh, with Israel. Um, let me just talk about some good news here because we're going to an end. Um, the latest news out of, out of Israel on the pandemic, okay? Obviously, uh, Israel is full of, well, their vaccine, they're way ahead of the rest of the world in vaccinating their, po their population, All right? This is this morning, the latest numbers from Israel show a 94% drop in symptomatic COVID infections among 600,000 people who have received both doses, okay? 94% reduction. Fantastic. The vaccinated group was 92% less likely to develop severe il illness. So even if you get sick, if you got vaccinated and you get sick, you don't get really sick. 92% reduction in serious sickness. What they're saying is it's now unequivocal that Pfizer's vaccine against the coronavirus is incredible because I believe that's the only a vaccine they're using in Israel right now is incredibly effective in real life one week after the second dose. And it's even more effective two weeks after the second dose. The totals are 42% of the 9 million, roughly 9 million people in Israel have been have got their first vaccination and 28% of the entire population uh, has been fully vaccinated. So they're seeing uh, precipitous drops. And it's a darn good thing because Israel a quarter of all the people who have died in Israel from Corona died in January. I mean, it, it, it was really getting out of control. And that's why they locked the country down again in December. Uh, you know, they're, whether lockdowns work or not, that's a completely different uh, uh, conversation. I don't know. I'm not that technically uh, uh, able to answer that, but you know, Israel is, is doing the best that they can and they're way ahead of the rest of the world. And they're, they're basically the Petri dish. For the vaccine for the vaccine. Let's talk about a couple of little things that are, are good news. The, the biggest news is, is how well they're doing with COVID. Um, it, it, it's really, they, they also had a study of, of over 400,000 uh, Israelis, uh, actually 800,000, 400,000 got the vaccine, 400,000 didn't. And out of the 400,000 that got it, 254 uh, came down with an infection all with mild symptoms. And 22 days after the second vaccination of those 400,000, no infections were reported. So just fantastic news uh, for them. Um, is an Israeli company called Sentech, S-C-E-N. T-E-C-H, medical, Sentech Medical, says it has developed an instant coronavirus breath test that's 98% effective. Um, you blow into this thing for 10 seconds, and then within five seconds, you get a result. And it can tell whether you uh, are positive for corona, negative for corona, or you have antibodies, which means you had it before, right? And don't have it now. And so it can detect asymptomatic people who are asymptomatic. If you've got it and you have no signs, it can still detect it. This, and they're seeking FDA approval uh, right now. And this is what will allow you to get on a plane, to go to a sporting event, to go to a concert, to with, with, uh, with confidence that you're not sick or for a venue to let you in or a plane or a country to let you in because you'll be able to prove in 20 seconds, right, 10 seconds, to take the test, 10 seconds to get the result, whether or not you got it. So th this is just huge, right? Um, I wanna say that my wife and I have, have talked about going to Israel, 
as soon as travel opens up. And we've talked about expanding the trip to include some of the countries that are part of the Abraham Accords. And here's my vision. My vision is that when we enter the UAE or Bahrain and you walk up to immigration and you know, all of you have traveled uh, internationally, you walk up and the, the immigration officer will say to you always, what's the purpose of your visit, right? And I wanna say to him to say thank you for making peace with Israel. And that's why we're here. We're here to just be here to say thank you, to spend some money in your country, to acknowledge that your country has made peace with Israel. And, and I just, it, it will, I, I don't even know if I'll be able to say it without tears in my eyes because it's not a prospect that has existed in my lifetime. And, and it so enthuses me that we may be on the cusp of uh, Arab-Israeli peace. A couple of little things, Chevron Corporation. And I, I apologize if I noted this in the last lecture. So I, I, uh, has agreed, uh, they're gonna participate, they're gonna put in uh, uh, $235 million to build a new pipeline from Israel's Mediterranean gas lines to Egypt. Now, why is that important? A major oil company in the world, this is the first time that they're partnering with Israel. Any Now, Nobel Energy out of the United States has been doing the drilling off the coast. They weren't a real major uh, uh, international oil company, even though now they, they've got billions and billions of value out of these uh, uh, fines, uh, gas fields they found. But now you have one of the largest oil companies in the world that is willing to partner with Israel because the political environment has changed. They no longer have to worry about the Arabs saying, we're gonna throw you out of all of our deals in all of the Middle East because you're dealing with Israel. See, Nobel wasn't involved in all the Arab countries. They, they couldn't get thrown out. But the Exxons and the, and the Chevrons and the Totals and the, uh, you know, of the world, the BPs, now can come to Israel and do deals with Israel. And, and so it's a really important uh, uh, development. And then I was watching this one thing, you know, you, you can look at and find all these Israeli technologies that are, that are in development, but, um, or, uh, or weapon systems that are in development. But you know, one of the cool ones that I came across was a company called Nanomedic. And you know, nanotechnology is this little micro technology. And it's really, really cool stuff. If you don't know much about it, do a teeny bit of reading. It's, it's fascinating. And they have divine, de designed what's called a spin care wound burn system. And instead of putting bandages over a burn and then having to constantly change um, the, the bandages, which is very painful because it pulls on the skin and so on, to even see what's going on. This thing is a clear translucent and it spins out this little covering that protects the burn, helps it heal. You can see what's going on with it right through it. You don't have to take it off. It, it's a such a cool video. And, you know, this is something that applies all over the world. I mean, there's burn injuries all the time for numerous reasons all over the world. It's just great to see Israel uh, developing this kind of stuff. But I think the most important thing, um, you know, that that's going on right now is um, trying to get COVID under control, um, peace, potential peace uh, between Israel and the Arabs. I, I just want to say that there's so little that's really good news out there. And that is really good news. There's a couple of questions. I think I have two minutes to be on time. Comment. Okay, comment. Yes. Comment says, thank you for appreciating. Okay. Yeah. Today, the Medical Israeli Association gave Dr. Fauci a prize for $1 million for sticking to science. That was uh, announced by Julie Galper. Thank you, Julie, for letting us know. Interesting. Interesting. Listen, anybody who's trying to help us get to the, the end of this, um, you know, what, whatever that reward is, a pat on the back, a million dollars, whatever it is, um, you know, there's been so much misinformation, disinformation, mistakes, stuff that has not been understood. This has been a, a horribly not straight road. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're, everybody's trying. I think everybody has the right intentions. I, I don't really believe, and I know some people do, that there are conspiracies to, you know, that, that to actually make it bad or let it be bad. I, I don't buy into those. I think everybody has a good heart. I think there's been a lot of erroneous information out there, but we're all trying to get it right, I hope. 
Thank you, Dan. Uh, in the comments, Myrna said, thank you. Great lecture as always, Kola Kavod. Dan, thank you so, so much for enlightening us and for leaving on such a great note. We have a lot of hope for our future. And thank you all for attending. And don't forget to check the chat for uh, links to the next uh, Middle East update with Mark Silverstein and our uh, Jewish International Jewish Film Festival with all kinds of Israeli uh, films and some of our upcoming senior departments. Thank you so, so much. All right. I, I see one question here real quick. What's the best way to stay up on latest uh, Israeli discoveries and accomplishments? Okay, so from uh, technology, Israel C21 talks about uh, medical and technological advancements all the time. What's Israel doing? Uh, on the political and geopolitical front, um, uh, dailyalert.org, I think is, is an excellent site. So uh, that would be my answer to that question. Okay, thank um, you everybody. Can, can, can yes. we get copies of this too? This is going to be recorded and I'll eventually post it to our uh, Lawrence Family JCC YouTube channel. Give me a few days or a week or so to, to work on it because okay. I don't know how to do it myself, but I'll find out. Okay. okay everybody great. stay thank safe. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Dan, well, stay everybody. warm. Thank you, Lee, for hostessing the uh, moderating <laughs> the, the, the questions. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.